Hello, I'm Donald McCauley and welcome to MedicsVoices.com where we talk to the key opinion leaders in health and medicine around the world. Today we're in Canada and I'm talking to Anne McCauley. And just to ensure there's no confusion, we're not related. <laughs> and you've had a fascinating career, but you didn't start off in Canada. Tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, yes, I'm first generation Canadian. I was um, born in in the UK, a, a Scottish mother and an English father. And uh, we moved around quite a lot um, because of, you know, really because of the war and because my father had been in naval intelligence through the war and so on and so forth. But as of the age of eight, uh, we moved to a a small village outside of Cambridge, England, so a little north of London, and that was my education. Two years in a two-roomed elementary schoolhouse, and uh, and then um, high school in in Cambridge, and then after that, um, straight to medical school, which is what you did in the UK, and uh, at St Andrews University in Scotland, because. Um, I chose to be in Scotland because of my, uh, you know, partial Scottish heritage. So then tell me about your journey to Canada. Uh, so, yeah, five years of medical school, one year of um, uh, internships, which, you know, that's what it was in those days. <laughs> I did an extra six months of um, obstetrics because I was interested in becoming a rural family physician doing home obstetrics, you know, with the support of the midwives, which was a very well organized um, program, you know, within the UK. And after that, I did six months locum in uh, outside uh, in the middle of England, so in Shakespeare country. And in the middle of all of that, met uh, a person who became my husband, and we emigrated to Canada, to Montreal. So then tell me about your journey into practice and where you practiced and what practice was like. Um, moving into Quebec, uh, I was not eligible for a Quebec license. <laughs> Um, so I did a number of small things, including uh, a, a short time as a residency. And then I got my medical license and I was had been uh, uh, chatting to people in um, family practice, general practice within Montreal, and hadn't really felt that I had found, you know, the right place uh, to be. And then, Took took a locum position for one month in a underserved area in Montreal, where in 1970, this was before Medicare came to uh, Montreal to Quebec, so medicine was still privatized, and uh, this there was some socially minded McGill faculty, McGill medical students who had start a community-run um, centre within this impoverished area of Montreal. And through that, I met some medical students, interestingly enough, who are also working with the Mohawk community of Gonawagi, which is just outside Montreal, a pop community of about 8,000 people. And they had just been successful in persuading the federal government to transfer control of health to the community. So they had just received funds and permission to do that, and then they needed a doctor, and the students asked me if I would be interested. So that was a huge stroke of luck. That's how I came to be the first doctor ever hired by the community uh, to serve the community. So Kanawaki, now that's very interesting. Tell us a little bit more about that, because this is an indigenous community. Yes, you're absolutely right. This is an indigenous community. These are First Nations uh, peoples. This is a Mohawk of the Iroquois Confederacy. And 
what's important for you to know, other people to know, is that until then, the federal government had um, hired and dispatched physicians to all indigenous communities across the country. It went back to the Indigenous um, Act of, in the 18, 1880s. So from the community point of view, they had no control of who worked in communities, who was sent to their communities, and they had no control once they got there. And as you might imagine, not all of these physicians were you know, of the best, of the highest quality. And so the community was really quite upset with some of the physicians that had been sent to them. And uh, this was the beginning of the movement of self, uh, self-control uh, that was starting to um, emerge across the country. They had already taken control of education about five years earlier, and uh, now they were taking control of health. Now you were there as the doctor, and you were in clinical practice, and then you made a transition into research. And I've heard you describe that you you stumbled into research almost by accident. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, so I was hired in 1970, and um, with the explicit understanding that I was there to help community, support community in meeting their goals. And I think that was a very um, important background uh, for the later research. So, in the seventies, and then in the early, and then the next major step was in the early eighties. Um, a very dynamic young um, Mohawk member of the community graduated in medicine from McGill, did his family, two years family medicine residency at McGill as well, and came back to the community as a family physician. And he and I and the other doctors in, in the family medicine, you know, small hospital, we had a small hospital there as well, were quite concerned the high numbers of people who presented with type two diabetes. And in those days, there were no figures in Canada, no statistics in Canada for type two diabetes in indigenous peoples. In fact, there were, all, there were very few um, statistics for uh, the general population, but there was an early, early first study from the US uh, showing uh, very high rates of uh, prevalence, rates of type 2 diabetes in indigenous populations. So we set out to document that, and we showed, yes, that the rate was twice the national average. And then we went on to look at the rates of complications from type 2 diabetes and the rates of complications for people with diabetes in the communities Within the community, um, I'm talking heart attacks, strokes, amputations, renal disease, blindness, uh, were six times higher than the same age group without diabetes in the community. We had, we were working with the hospital charts. So we had permission from the hospital um, to do this study with the understanding that we would absolutely share the results afterwards. And so Louis T and I uh, set off to um, share these results with the community. And we made presentations who, who, to whichever organization you know was interested. We did about probably 10, 12 presentations right through the community. But we started off by explaining, you know, what type two diabetes was. You know, we had a simple diagram, you know, with uh, with the pancreas and insulin, <laughs> and then we talked about the textbook complications from diabetes, and then we talked about the results from the community, and we ended these presentations uh, recommending that people were more physically active. We were recommending walking and uh, to eat in healthier ways with the hope of reducing these rates in the future. 
And the big thing about that was that about six months afterwards, um, some of the elders came to us and they said, we'd like you to do something. We'd like to do something about uh, this. We'd like you to um, focus on young children. We have our diabetes. We've got all our problems. We want to prevent diabetes in the next generation. This is seven generations of thinking that the decisions you make now will, af will affect the future. As long as, however old or however long you live, you'll never know seven generations of your own family. So you began with this, let's call it quantitative research, and this led you to what became the backbone of your research career, which was participatory research. Tell us yeah. about that. Yeah, so we weren't, I mean, we weren't qualified researchers. We had enough information to do basic, <laughs> you know, basic problem studies like that. Uh, we spoke to um, Gilles Paradis at McGill, who was involved with primary cardiovascular prevention. And he, in turn, talked to Louise Potver, who was in health promotion at University of Montreal, who had just come back from uh, University of British Columbia, where she had been training with Lawrence W. Green, um, who was leading participatory research promotion in the U.S. And she suggested participatory research, and it just made such sense because... I had been hired way back in 1970 to partner with the community taking control of health. And this just made so much sense. So that's how we began. In fact, it took us seven years to get funding. <laughs> there was no money in those days. Um, but right at the beginning, we had a very uh, dynamic uh, person from the community who had been the high school principal in, in the local high school, um, Alex McCumber. And uh, when we finally got funding, um, you know, he set out to encourage people to uh, become members of a community advisory board. So the community advisory board represents the community in the participatory research, uh, you know, relationship. And one of the first things we did was to um, set out with community, with the new community advisory board, to develop a code of research ethics. How are we going to work together? You know, what is participatory research all about? And uh, we wrote in an original draft. And I can remember writing that, you know, it's going to be the rights of the community and the rights of the researchers in this partnership and uh, one of the early members of the community advisory board uh, who is now Dr. Trina Delomier said no it's the obligations of the community advisory board and it's the obligations of the researchers to the, the partnership. This was key because you know this was the Mohawk tradition you don't have rights. You have obligations in this world to everybody to work together. So this was a, a very clear statement right at the beginning of um, the importance of, you know, a real, real partnership. So this developed over time. So talk to me about the leadership then of this participatory research community. Yeah, so the Community Advisory Board has remained the final decision-making body in our project. And we're very proud to say that we're heading now into our 30th um, year. We're going to have our 30-year celebration in the fall. And there's many things to, uh, to celebrate. Uh, first of all, outside researchers have documented that the Incidence of type 2 diabetes in the community has dropped from 50 new uh, people per year in about 2000 down to 40 per year. Um, the most recent uh, figures that we've got was 2020, 2021. 
So it's still a high number of people, but it's a clear sign of success. And the other major successes are um, the big social sort of social movement within the community to understand um, much more about the importance of healthy lifestyles. And the training that we've been able to offer um, a community researcher training. Um, so in the last 30 years, we've trained uh, five people. Oh, no, more than that now. Uh, eight people from, from the community, you know, with master's degrees. And Dr. Trina Lormier did her PhD with us, um, then went outside uh, to do her postdoc and is now associate professor uh, at McGill and scientific director of the Ganawagi Schools Diabetes Prevention Project. So here you have you know, community capacity building all the way through uh, and now community leadership as well. Now, after this 30 year gestation, participatory research has now been accepted worldwide and the World Health Organization are organizing a conference to recognize participatory research. What does this mean to you? Ah, oh, it's extraordinary. <laughs> it was so tough in the early days. Oh my goodness, you know, what are you doing? You know, why aren't you publishing faster? You know, blah, blah, blah. It's so exciting. Um, uh, I actually became so excited by how participatory research was working in Ganawagi that I started um, a center within the Department of Family Medicine called Participatory Research at McGill. And uh, that continues to this day as well. So that, that also was very exciting. Um, no, it's, it's so exciting to see this general movement, not only in health, but education and in uh, population at large. Well, you've been a role model in leadership and education and research, but do you have advice for nascent researchers in primary care? They should get their qualifications first, I guess. <laughs> yes. I, uh, at one point, I planned to sort of stop and take a break and do my master's in public health. Um, and I really recommend and encourage people to get research training as a, um, you know, the, the training in clinical care. It's invaluable. You approach questions differently. You, you know, you have the skill set to answer your questions. You know, I've been you know, necessarily very dependent on other team members for the you know, the high level of qualitative and quantitative research, you know, within the teams that I've been involved with. But it would have, uh, it would have been, would have been good if I'd had my own, <laughs> my own research training. You know, I've been lucky, I've been able to build my career on promoting participatory research. I was one of the early family physicians in Canada to um, adopt that. Um, you know, through the North American Primary Care Research Group, uh, you know, we promoted it. And, uh, you know, the other aspect of my career has also been um, in Indigenous health. I was asked by McGill to start the Indigenous health curriculum for the medical school. And that's important for all family, all physicians to understand uh, some of the real issues and challenges that all Indigenous peoples uh, face. And not only those of us who choose to work in Indigenous communities, but those who specialize, they're going to be taking care, most likely, of Indigenous patients in, in the hospital at some point in their careers. And it's important to not only know the history, but you know, to practice cultural safety. And it can only be the indigenous person who can actually evaluate if they feel safe within a, within a clinical setting. 
um, if I hear professional people saying, oh, yes, I practice cultural safety, you know, you're doing your best, but you can't, you, you can't be one to assess that. And finally, let me ask you, after a lifetime of contribution to family medicine, particularly in Indigenous and vulnerable communities, how do you see the future of family medicine in Canada? Oh, I'm so worried about family medicine in Canada right now. A very high percentage of the population doesn't have a family physician, doesn't have continuity of care. It's, it's atrocious. And uh, especially... For vulnerable people, for elderly people, um, there is so much evidence uh, you know, from Barbara Starfield in the early days in the U.S. and you know, wonderful recent article by Kurt Stange, sort of summarizing all this, that continuity of care from a family physician who's sort of a generalist and sees. Uh, the patient as part of a family and part of a community and, you know, with their own lives. It's so important. It improves the lives of patients. It improves the quality of uh, practice for physicians. And it saves money. It saves the government money. <laughs> and why governments are not pouring money into primary care, I find just disgraceful. Thank you very much for sharing so much of your life and career and for your immense contribution to primary care. And may your research and those principles last for the seven generations. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you too.